Good morning, good day, good evening, good overnight, whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Withered fig tree. That's going to be the subject of this particular Bible study. I have been asked many times over the years, why did Christ curse the fig tree on the way into Jerusalem and of course the answer is uh, very simple he did it as a type an example a symbology if you will which we're going to cover and get into here in just a moment um, I am not going to do a great long talk and lead into this I don't really think it's necessary I know that a lot of people are panicked out there, but by the way, I hope you all had a great Passover and that uh, you took communion and uh, enjoyed the day and re rejoiced in our Lord and Savior as, as we should. But what I was about to say is people are all panicked now and I'm seeing all kinds of uh, crazy posts on YouTube and on Facebook about this solar eclipse and um, you know it's nothing to worry about our father told us there would be signs in the heavens and is it a sign well perhaps I mean it does make a great big X across America which you know could be symbolic of many things it could be symbolic of Abraham's arms crossed Ephraim and Manasseh and such but uh, regardless is it the end of the world? In other words, is the, is the end of the world going to come tomorrow with this eclipse? And of course the answer to that is no. I mean, are, are we in one world government yet? No. Have the two witnesses shown up? No. Has the false Christ returned and claimed to be Jesus yet Satan? No. And most importantly, has the seventh trump sounded and has the true Christ returned? The answer to all of those is no. So obviously, what is going to happen tomorrow? An eclipse. And it's something that happens quite frequently on this earth. It's not a big deal. It's not anything to panic about. It's not anything to worry about. However, a watchman is always on duty to watch and notice these things when they happen. So that's all I'm going to say about the eclipse. Just don't lose your minds over it. It's, it's not the end of the world. It's, some are predicting. I'm not going to say so many, but some are predicting. At any rate, withered fig tree is going to be the subject here. We're going to be talking about why Christ cursed this fig tree on the way into Jerusalem. And we're going to be beginning in the book of Mark, chapter 11. The book of St. Mark, chapter 11, one of the four Gospels. And before we begin this Bible study, as we always do, and you should, you should always do before you're going to study our Father's Word, let us go before our Father and ask for guidance and wisdom and understanding of these things written in His most holy Word. So, brothers and sisters, let us pray, and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, O Heavenly Father. We come before you this day once again, Father, to ask for understanding of these scriptures. We ask you to lead us and guide us, Father. We ask you to reveal the deeper hidden meanings and the mysteries of this great word that you've given us. We ask you to shine the light of truth upon the path that we are to walk on, Father, that we may know you better. We ask you, Father, to open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. And we ask these things, Father, nothing wavering. And we give thanks, Father, for our Lord and Savior, 
who we just celebrated his um, death, his passion, his persecution, his passion, and his resurrection. So, these things we ask, Father, through his name, in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach Christos, Jesus Christ, Amen, and Amen. So, we're going to begin this in um, Mark chapter 11. Excuse me while I scratch my back for a minute. Okay. So, here we go. Mark chapter 11, and uh, this of course being the Gospels. We're going to begin in verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage, that is to say the house of figs, and who we're talking about the day here in the subject, you always need to know that when you're just picking up something here. It's Christ and his disciples. When they had come nigh unto Jerusalem, unto Bethpage, which is the house of figs, and Bethany, which is the house of dates, at the Mount of Olives, that's to say Mount Olivet, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. In other words, he sent two witnesses in before him. Kind of a interesting uh, type there. Verse 2. And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. In other words, the, the village that we're coming up near to. And as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never a man sat. In other words, this, this is an animal that has never had a man on him. Loose him and bring him. Of course, you all know what would happen if you tried to get on a colt where never a man sat. He would throw you. But that's not going to happen to our Lord because he is the Son of God. Having power over animals and over nature. Verse 3. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. In other words, he will let you have the colt and you can, may take it with you. Verse 4. And they went their way and found the colt tied by a door without in a place where two ways met. In other words, where two streets met. Probably a corner or a little uh, avenue. And they lose him. Verse 5. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye? Loosing the cold. In other words, why are you loosing this cold? Why are you taking this cold? Verse 6. And they said unto him, Even as Jesus had commanded. In other words, they said the Lord had need, hath need of him. And they let him go. In other words, they allowed them to take the cold. Verse 7. And they brought the cold to Jesus and cast their garments on him. In other words, to make a little makeshift saddle. And he sat upon him. In other words, Christ sat upon this colt. The colt didn't buck. Verse 8. And many spread their garments in the way. That is to say, right there in the road. They spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off trees and strawed them in the way. And of course, we know that these were palm trees. And this is where the tradition of Palm Sunday comes from. This would be the day that Christ entered in Jerusalem. Verse 9. And they that went before, and they that followed, in other words, those that were walking before him on the colt, and those that were following after him, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In other words, Hosanna is a word that means save now, or save us now. And then they said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In other words, these people recognized Jesus as the Anointed One, as the Messiah. Verse 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. In other words, they are identifying themselves of the tribe of Judah here, of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In other words, save us now in the highest. Well, what is the highest? God. The highest name you can call upon. In other words, in urgency even. 
Now, what is the symbology here of these people coming out to meet Christ? The symbology is that they were believers. And they were there ready to greet Him. This was not anything usual for this time, for if a king or someone of ultimate importance, a, a, a dignitary or someone of uh, wide fame and acclaim of note, came to the city, the peoples would come out to meet them and welcome them into the city. But this was much more. Because they were welcoming the son of David. They were welcoming their king. They were welcoming the Messiah. Because they did believe this was the Messiah. They knew of the miracles. Many of these people had probably even seen them. So they were welcoming him to Jerusalem. But we're going to take a small side trip here. Where is this prophesied to happen that this event would come to pass? Well, if you go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, Zechariah chapter 9, we will read a few verses from that book here. Uh, we will begin with verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 9. And verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 9 declares, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king, and you will notice that the word king here is uppercase, cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, which is to say he's meek, riding upon an ass and upon the foal, or the colt of a foal of an ass. In other words, a foal being a, uh, a young one. Verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem. In other words, all battle is going to cease. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. That is to say to the unlearned, even unto the Gentile. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea. And from the river even to the ends of the earth. In other words, a river flows out into the sea. And you could say this is Jordan, since it is so nearby. But uh, the Jordan flows into the Dead Sea would be the only problem with that. The Dead Sea being a representation of hell since there is no life in the Dead Sea. However, what this really has uh, reference to is it's going to trickle down as a river and it's going to grow and it's going to cross the seas as Christianity has. Verse 11. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, in other words, the covenant of who? Of the king. I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. In other words, where there's no living water. Now, what did Christ accomplish when he died upon the cross? Well, he defeated death. But what else did he accomplish for the three days that he was in the tomb? He went to the other side of the gulf, to what is known as hell. In uh, some mentionings in the Bible, they call it hell. And he freed the prisoners from where there was no living water. In other words, they were there awaiting judgment. There was no living water. They are away from God. So that's the lesson that we need to take away from this. Now, Matthew chapter 12, verse 5, bears out another witness of this event of Christ coming into Jerusalem on the fall of an ass, as well as John verse, or chapter 12, verse 15. But let's go back now to Mark chapter 11, but I don't want you to miss what has happened here. I don't want you to miss the fact that the people came out to greet him and brought him into the city. Many people try to use this biblical reference as, oh, they came out to meet Christ. To meet the Lord in there, they were raptured away. That's exactly the opposite of what this means. They came out to meet him and escorted him in 
to Jerusalem. Now, at this time he was not to be king, but one day he shall come to be king. Verse 11. And Jesus entered in Jerusalem and into the temple, in other words, into God's house. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, it was evening, he went out of Bethany with the twelve, in other words, with his disciples. Verse 12. And on the morrow, in other words, the next day, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Now, we're going to have to do some work on this here, or you're going to get the wrong impression about it. The word hungry here, as in the phrase, he was hungry, is G3983, and it is Pinao, from the same as G3993, through the idea of a pinching toil or pine. In other words, pining. You know what it means to pine? It means to, to uh, desire something. Then it says to famish absolutely or comparatively. Okay, and you, you want to pay attention to these definitions and why they say the things they do. Now, so this means that he could have been hungry. He could have actually been hungry. But it says comparatively, and then it says figuratively. In other words, comparatively means as a comparison, and figuratively means this was done for figurative reasons. It's not a literal. Figuratively to crave to be in hunger. Okay, so Christ saw this fig tree, and he desired something of this fig tree. Verse 13. And seeing a fig tree afar off, I don't want you to skip that part that says afar off. Seeing a fig tree afar off. In other words, it was some distance. Now, from the time of Christ until the generation of the fig tree is some distance. So, this could even be used as a metaphor. Christ saw this coming afar off. But we'll let it stand as it's read here. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. In other words, he was looking for fruit. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. In other words, what is the deeper meaning to this verse? It is not the time of the generation of the fig tree, nor in the spring, when this happened on Palm Sunday before the Passover, was it the summer or the harvest, so there would be no figs. So Christ knew the time of year it was, and he knew that there should not be figs on this tree naturally. So he was looking at this tree spiritually to see if there, were, if there was fruit growing on it. Having regards to the generation of the fig tree. Because again, this is spring. This is before the Passover. This is not the harvest when there would have been figs. So then, since there were no figs, why did Christ curse the fig tree? Because it was done as a symbology. It was a fruitless tree that bears no fruit. The relevance is the parable of the fig tree, where this generation bears no fruit. You have to understand what a fruitless tree means to Christ. All we have to do is go look at many other verses in the Bible where Christ tells you, any tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Well, what is bad fruit? Bad fruit is something you can't eat, you can't partake of. But this has no fruit on it. Nothing. There's nothing there but leaves. And where do we read of fig leaves? Well, remember Adam and Eve sewing their aprons together with fig leaves? When they had committed the sin in the garden with Satan? The serpent, that is to say. Verse 14. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. In other words, they were witnesses. Now, I'm sure that the disciples, being uh, the kind of people that misunderstood so many things that Christ did, are standing there wondering, why is he talking to a tree? Why is he talking to a fig tree? 
and saying no fruit's going to grow on thee hereafter and no man's going to eat of thee. Again, this was a symbology. In other words, this tree would bear no fruit. Not this particular tree. The tree is really irrelevant in the story as far as this particular tree. It's the generation of the fig tree that bears no fruit that Christ was cursing. And this tree was a symbolic type of it. Verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that bought and sold in the temple and to overthrow the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Why were they selling doves in God's temple? And why were there money changers in God's temple? Well, they had turned God's, money, uh, God's temple into a money racket. And they were selling doves as offerings. An offering to God was supposed to be the best of what you had. Remember why Cain was cursed way back in the Old Testament? Because he did not bring forth the first fruits of his uh, surplus that he got on the earth. I shouldn't say surplus. I should say of the produce that he got from the earth. He did not bring forth his first fruit, and his brother righteous Abel brought his firstlings of his flock. So you see the fingers of the Kenites all over this here. They had turned God's church into a prosperity ministry. Bring in your money and buy our doves and go make your offering to the Lord, and we're going to make plenty of money, and we're going to have the finest food and the finest mansions, and the finest chariots, and we're just going to be all happy Christians, smiling, we're going to slick our hair back under our little holy uh, hats. Verse 16. And would not suffer any man that they should carry any vessel through the temple, in other words, the temple is a place of, place of prayer. It's not for this. It's not for vessels of money to be carried through, gold and silver. You know how they pass plates around at churches now these days? That money is supposed to go to the church or to support the ministry. But so many now just take buckets and buckets and buckets of money in and get richer and richer and richer and don't really do that much with it towards what should be done with the money in their prosperity ministries. Verse 17. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? Verse 18. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. In other words, they got upset with him for destroying their little money racket. So they sought a way to snare him so that they could kill him. Lie in wait to kill him. But they feared him. Because it's written in the next verse, For they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. In other words, the people were not just astonished. They were probably refreshed by it. They had probably been around these money makers for all these years, and they knew that this wasn't the proper thing. Verse 19. And when even was come, he went out of the city. Verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Okay, not from the top down, from the roots up. What are the roots of a tree? Think about generations and a tree being a generation of people. This was dried up from the roots up. Verse 21. And Peter calling to remember it saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Verse 22. And Jesus answering saith, answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whatsoever, excuse me, whosoever 
shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, <clears throat> and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatever so whatsoever he saith. Now, is Christ saying, go out as a Christian and walk up to a mountain in Virginia or the Carolinas or any of the Appalachians and say, Mountain, remove thou hence this instant because I, in the name of Christ, command you to do so. What do you think is going to happen? you think that mountain's going to move for you? No. Mountain here is symbolic, uh, symbolic of a nation, a people. Now, what people were on this mountain at the time? Who was in control? Who sat in the seat of Moses? The scribes and Pharisees. And who were the scribes and Pharisees largely made up of? Mongrel Jews, which were not of Judah, nor of Benjamin, nor of the Levites, and naturally, our old friends, the Canaanites. So Christ says, if you have faith... And you say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall have not doubt in his heart, but shall believe in those things which he saith shall come to pass. Whatsoever he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. In other words, what has Christ just said here? I give you power over these. Over these who? Over these non believers. Over these money changers. Over these who are making God's temple into a joke and a money making racket. Over these who would pervert God's word. Over these who thirst for the blood of, of Christ and his saints. The same that killed the, the, uh, the prophets. Verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. And ye shall receive them. Now, does this mean, Oh, Lord, I need a brand new Mack truck to pull my trailer. No, that, that's not what it means. Does it mean, Oh, Lord, I believe that you're going to give me this brand new Ferrari Testarossa that I want. No, that's not what it means either. Whatsoever ye desire. Okay, if you're a Christian, what should you desire above all else? To be able to reach other Christians. To find a way to plant seeds with them. To find a way to deliver the truth to them. How many times have you planted seeds with people and it does not come to pass? If you pray believing and you ask God for a way, He will give you a way. Now, you can plant the seeds, and the seeds may plant. Does that mean they're going to mature and grow into a tree? Not always. Why? Because there are a mixed multitude of people on this earth that have been drawn off by a bunch of false doctrines of men. So don't think that if you walk up to a mountain and say, Move thou mountain, I have commanded it in the name of Jesus that it's going to happen. Even if you believe that's going to happen. Because that's not what this is. This is metaphoric speech used by Christ. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any. In other words, if you have something against anybody, forgive. That your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. In other words, if you go up to God with a bunch of filth on you, asking for praise, asking for things, and you've got a bunch of sins on your back, do you think God's going to reward you? I think not. Now, it is possible that God, if you're trying to help someone, even carrying your sins, may allow you to help someone. But anything that you ask for, you want to be clear and clean, washed in the blood of the Lamb, 
and to forgive aught against any. Aught means anything. If you have anything against any that you're holding a grudge about, drop it. Forgive, in other words. As God forgives you, as Christ forgives. Verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. In other words, you must forgive. Now, there are certain qualifications to this that we will read in other parts of the Bible. Such as, do you have to forgive someone that does not ask you for forgiveness if they have really wronged you? Well, not really. I mean, eventually you will over time because time heals wounds. And it will become just an earthly thing and you will say, oh, forget it. You know? Don't carry a grudge to your grave is, is kind of what I'm saying. Make yourself right with God. Verse 27. And they come again to Jerusalem and as he was walking in the temple there come to him chief priests and scribes and elders. Verse 28. And say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And of what do you mean coming in here and messing up our money and our income for the church? And I'm quite sure they were powder coating it and making it sweet. Why have you come in and done these things? We were making money for the Lord to feed the poor and to do good things and to cast out demons and I or in God's name. Who gave you the authority to come in here and cast these people out? Verse 29. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question. And answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 30. Christ continuing to speak. The baptism of John. In other words, John the Baptist, who baptized in the name of God, which they knew, was it from heaven or of men? In other words, was his calling from heaven or was it for his own self-glory? Was his calling from men? Answer me. Verse 31, And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then, why then did you not believe him? Verse 32, But if we say of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. In other words, he, he's kind of trapped them here. So what are they going to do? They're going to do what any narcissist would do. They're not going to admit they're wrong. Verse 33. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. In other words, we don't know whether his calling was from heaven or not. We don't know whether he did it of men. They did know. But they would not answer. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. See, they knew the answer. They knew that all held John as a prophet, and they knew that his calling was from heaven. But naturally, many of these are the children of Cain, which is the son of Satan. So naturally, as liars, they're not going to admit the truth. But they would have had their answer if they had said his calling was from heaven. And Christ would have answered, I'm very sure, so too is my calling from my Father, which is in heaven. But instead, they said, we cannot tell. And Christ said, neither do I tell you. Now, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 8 for a moment here. We're going to learn a little more about the fig tree and, and what relevance this has here. Jeremiah chapter 8, we're going to begin at verse 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. Now this also has to do, uh, quite frankly, uh, with the Valley of Dry Bones, in, in a manner of speaking here. 
because truth caused those bones and the sinew to return and it brought a dead people back to life. So that's kind of what we're pointing here to uh, as a metaphor, figuratively speaking, verse 2. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven whom they have loved. In other words, they worship the host of heaven. And whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. So, that one uh, paragraph right there, that one verse, short paragraph I should say, you're going to spread all these bones before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven which they worshipped, which they loved. In other words, they served the fallen angels and they served the stars and the planets. They worshipped Cayune, which is now known as the planet Saturn, the, the uh, sixth planet in our solar system, six being relevant. The only planet with bands or rings around it and the only planet with a hexagonal shape at the top of it. and a planet that was worshipped. And these bones are not going to be gathered up nor be buried. In other words, these bones are not going to listen to the Word of God and they're not going to gather bone to bone, sinew to sinew, and raise up as did the Valley of the Dry Bones. But these are going to be left for dung upon the face of the earth. You know what dung is? <clears throat> Quite frankly, it's crap. Verse 3. And death shall be chosen rather than life. You know, there is such a deep thing in that. Do you know who death is? Who has the power of death? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. They're going to choose death rather than life. They're going to choose the false instead of the real. God. By all the residue of them that remain of this evil family which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Of course, we know who the evil family is, but you could even equate this to uh, the, the tribes of Israel and why they were sent into um, exile. In other words, they were very sinful, and God dispersed them took them off the good land which he had given to their fathers, which he promised them we would do if they did not obey his word and do his works. Verse 4. Moreover thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, They shall, shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Verse 5. When this... When... When then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? In other words, when it says, why then? I don't know why I said when. I don't know what's going on in my head today, but some of the computers are running a little bit slower, and so you just got to bear with me and, and recognize the source here. Um, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. You know what deceit is? That's deception. To lies. They refuse to return. Return to who? To God. So, now you know what the dry bones are actually talking about. They're not talking about literal bones. There are bones in human bodies. Okay? But if it's a dead man walking like Satan, or like these that that, that worship false gods, they're as good as dead. So spread their bones out before the hosts of heaven under the sun and the moon. In other words, day and night. So what's God's message here? Why is this people of Jerusalem slidden back with a perpetual backslide? In other words, why have they continued to progress backwards? <coughs> I gave them this great land. I gave them this great jewel of a city, a kingdom. Why have they turned away and started worshiping other gods? Why do they hold fast to deceit and refuse to return to me? That is to say to God. Verse 6. 
I hearkened and heard. But they spake not aright. In other words, what does it mean when you speak not aright? It don't mean that you're just stuttering. It means that they, they lie. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into battle. In other words, when a horse is driven into battle, do you really think that horse comprehends what's about to happen? That they could be stuck with a sword or hit with a mace or uh, run through with a spear? No, that they obey their rider. In other words, they're rushing headlong into this false idol, this false idolatry. What do you think is going to happen when Satan comes to this earth, claiming to be Jesus Christ, looking the part, and having his uh, angelics with him, his nephilim, which look like the angels of heaven? People are going to go run into him headlong, in the same way. Verse seven. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. And the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. In other words, they know when to migrate. They know when winter's coming and when to hit the water or when to go burrow into a sand to stay warm. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. What was the judgment of the Lord? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto me any graven image. So the judgment comes down on them for what reason? Because they are against God. Verse 8. How do ye say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Lo, low, mean, low means look here. Certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. In other words, what do the, what do the scribes do? They translate and keep God's word. And we know who the scribes were, at least part of them. Now, does this give us license to say, well, the Bible has to be inaccurate because the scribes did this? No. Luckily, we have what is called the Masara, which means to transfer a thought from my mind to your mind with no loss. And the Masara texts lock in the scriptures so that they could not be changed. Oh, the, the Kenites would have loved to have changed them, as Satan loves to twist scripture, but they couldn't change them. Why they had people watching over them. And not only that, believe it or not, the scribes did have some respect for God in that the scribes, as many of the people of the Zionist belief today, believe that works get them into heaven. In other words, good works and repentance by killing animals. Making offerings, the best that they have. That's what they believed. However, did they obey the law? No. How do we know they didn't obey the law? They sought to kill Jesus. They, they killed the prophets. Later they would kill the apostles. <clears throat> They're murderers. Was it God's law that, their, that his temple should be made into a money-making racket? Absolutely not. Is it God's law today that prosperity ministries should bring in millions of dollars every year? No. I, I mean, did Christ live with a bunch of riches? Did the disciples of Christ, the apostles, live with a bunch of riches? No, they did not. Have Christians suffered all down through the ages and been taken advantage of by certain churches? <clears throat> and certain holy men that, well, I shouldn't say holy men, they claim to be holy men. Verse 9. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Do not forget that word, taken. Taken as in a snare. Remember in the New Testament, two shall be in the field, the one shall be left, the other shall be taken. Two women shall be grinding at the field, at the mill. The one shall be left, the other shall be taken. Same analogy here. 
The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed. In other words, they're confused and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? Uh, the uh, answer to that is little to none. They're wise in the ways of the world. They're wise at counting money. They're wise to be seen of men and to be blessed and to have greetings in the marketplaces and the upper room at feasts. But to follow the word of God and to obey it? No. To recognize the Son of God when he came through the prophecies? No. Verse 10. Therefore I will give their wives unto others and their fields unto them that shall inherit them. For everyone from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest everyone dealeth falsely. In other words, what does it mean to deal us falsely? It means they use false weights and balances. It means they lie. It means they deceitfully uh, pull the wool over the eyes of the people. They deal us falsely. Verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the people of my daughter slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. In other words, they decree peace. They decree that their way is the way of peace. And in today's world, the wolves that walk among sheep's clothing decree the name of Jesus. And they say that they worship Him and they have power through Him. And it's peaceful. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But Christ warned us about that too, didn't He? He said, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Because there is no peace. There will be no peace until Christ returns. Verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? That is to say filth, sin, iniquity? Nay, no. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. In other words, they didn't even blush at it. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Do you know when the time of their visitation shall be? Well, you could say that Rome casting them out of the Lamb was the time of their visitation, but that's not the visitation we're talking about here. They're going to fall to the Antichrist, and they are going to fall in the time when Christ comes. Many of them are going to get up and say, Lord, Lord, have we not healed in thy name and in thy name? Uh, cast out demons and done many wonderful works and Christ is going to tell them get out of my sight I never knew you ye that work iniquity well now you know what the iniquity that they work is it's a money racket it's false doctrines it's worship of themselves over God it's their reputation it's their power and their own glory Verse 13. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine. That's no fruit, my friend. Nor figs on the fig tree. You know what that means? There's only leaves. And the leaves shall fade. What happened and why did Christ wither the fig tree? It was to show you of things to come. And the things that I have given them shall pass away from him. In other words, the land that they have, the kingdom that they have, it's all going to be taken from them. The, their priesthood, going to be taken from them and given to worthy, given to the elect, given to the remnant, given to the apostles, given to the chosen. Verse 14. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourself. Let us enter into the defense cities. Let us be silent there, for the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. 
In other words, this is a desperation cry. What are we doing this for? Why are we sitting still doing this? Assemble yourself. Let us get into the defense city. In other words, let's get it back into that hedge that God put up around us. And let us be silent there. Let us hold our tongues. For the Lord God has put us to silence. We can't answer Him. And given us the water of gall to drink. Why? Because they earned it. Because we have sinned against the Lord. Verse 15. We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of health and behold, trouble. Remember, when Satan appears here on this earth claiming to be Yahshua, Christ returned, people are going to think it's the most peaceful and wonderful time, and for a short time, it will seem that way. Verse 16. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. And the whole land trembled at the name of his strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it. The city and those that dwell therein. What are we talking about here? Well, they came from Dan. Okay. So Dan, at this time, was near Babylon. And the whole land troubled at the neighing of his strong ones. Neighing is what the horses do when there's an army of horses coming at you. In other words, we're talking about Satan's locust army here uh, in the prophetical. Talking about the king of Babylon on the otherwise, historical. They are come and have devoured the land. Why is the word devoured here used? What do, lo what do locusts do? They devour everything. They have devoured the land and all that is there in it. Oh my Lord, don't you see how our Father is so good to us in telling us these things from His Word. Dual meanings. Far deeper reaching things written in His Word. They have devoured the land and all that is there in it. That's what the locust army does. The city even. The city of Jerusalem. And those that dwell therein. One reason why Christ told us, get away from the city. Verse 17. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Do you remember Revelation chapter 9? What's going to happen to the people when Satan comes here and releases his locust army? The scorpions are going to sting them, and the uh, the horses are going to have the heads of serpents and the teeth of lions and they're going to bite you. In other words, what happens when a serpent bites you? It poisons you. In other words, and they're not going to be charmed. In other words, what does a snake charmer do? He makes the snake obey him. These are not going to be charmed. They're going to have the mastery over these wicked people. Verse 18. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart felt faint in me. In other words, this is bad news. It is a reason to be sorrowful. Verse 19. Behold the, the voice of the people cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with their strange vanities? In other words, I want you to think about many things here. Okay? When Christ came to this city, did they reverence him as Emmanuel, God with us? Did he not come to Zion? Why is the lowercase king here used instead of the uppercase? Because Christ was in the flesh. But they provoked him to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities. In other words, they were worshipping things other than God, such as money. Do you know that money is a graven thing? It's got a superscription on it. Remember when they asked Christ, shall we pay taxes? Shall we pay Caesar? Tribute? 
And he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So in other words, render unto this earthly king the things which are earthly. But render unto God the things which are God's. What, what belongs to God? Your soul. Verse 20. The harvest is past and the summer is ended and we are not saved. In other words, they didn't make the cut, friend. Verse 21. For the heart of my daughter, excuse me, for the heart of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. That means dark, darkened, as in when a person is in, is in dark depression. Has nothing to do with skin tone. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? In other words, a healing balm? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? And the short and simple answer is because that's the way they wanted it. They chose darkness rather than the light. They chose earthly wealth, fame, and fortune or prosperity over the doctrine of God and misled people through their ignorance of His Word to not know the truth about the things that consummate the end of this earth age and what this generation of the fig tree even is. Luke 13. Let's go to Luke 13 now. Luke 13, and we're going to begin at verse chapter 6 because we're only going to read what's relevant here. He spake also this parable. Naturally, we're talking about Christ. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Okay, so why did Christ curse the fish, fig tree? He came to that fig tree and sought fruit on it and found none, found leaves. Verse 7. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, that is to say the, the gardener, the, uh, the plant husbandman, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? In other words, it's not going to bear fruit, cut it down. And why does he say three years here? How many years was Jesus Christ's ministry? How many times did he visit Jerusalem? In other words, how many times did he go in there at the Passover? Simple answer, three. In other words, it was probably the first two times that he passed right by that fig tree and didn't uh, even look at it. Or maybe he did look at it seeking fruit and saw none, figuratively speaking. But now he's angered. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cover it at the ground? And those, why am I bothering to let it grow if it's not going to do anything? And he, that is to say the vine dresser or the uh, dresser of the garden, Answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dug it. In other words, let me fertilize it. Verse 9. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Or, yeah. So, so what's being said here? He's saying, Lord, give me a chance to impart some truth to him, to dung it. Now, am I saying truth is dung? No. Tr dung is fertilizer, okay? So let me fertilize it. Let's see if we can get this tree to come back to life and start bearing fruit. Then if not, next year we'll cut it down. Kind of alluding to uh, the end of the fig tree generation. In other words, when the fig tree is going to be removed for good. All flesh is going to be removed. Now, we're going to go and we're going to read some other accounts here. 
We're going to read the same account as we read in Mark chapter uh, 11. And we're going to read it from Luke 21. So Luke 21, and we're going to begin at verse 17. Again, I'm only going to read the relevant. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. Okay, we already looked up this word hungered and uh, explained what it meant. It, it, it is figuratively to hunger. Figuratively to desire. Okay, and God wants fruit from his tree and from his vine. Because Israel is his vine and Israel is symbolic of the fig tree. And, but you know we have the good and the bad fig. But he's looking for fruit on this tree again, metaphorically. Verse 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. Again, what did Adam and Eve use to cover their nakedness after they had sinned with Satan? After sin was brought into the world? Found leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward for forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Uh, withered away? Now, I know this is a slightly different account. It's written a little differently than in the last gospel. But no, the gist is exactly the same. In other words, even the next day when they passed by, they would have still said, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And even though it says presently the fig tree weathered away, presently is a word that can mean, I mean, if you think about walking up to a tree and cursing it and coming back the next morning and the tree's gone, it's dead, that would be presently. I mean, you could say immediately. Uh, naturally, immediately it would have started dying from the roots up. But we'll move on. Verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not. See, that, that's an important qualifier. Ye shall not only do that which is done to this fig tree, or the fig tree, but also, if they shall, you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Again, we're not talking about the literal mountain here. Okay? The mountain is cast into the sea of people, you could say. In other words, lumped all in with them. The sea of people of the deceived, by the way. Verse 22. And all things, whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Again, if you're going to pray, you're not going to be asking for a, 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 a new um, Camaro. Or, or, or a new uh, five-story mansion. You're going to be doing things in the service of our Father. Those are the things you're going to receive. If it's something to edify the church, something to uh, reach those who have no eyes to see but are beginning to open their eyes, then it shall be done unto you. Now, I'm going to stop right here and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to begin at one of my favorite places here. We're going to start at verse 29. Again, I'm only reading the relevant. Uh, actually, this probably might not be as relevant as, as the parable of the fig tree where we're going. But it, it, it's very telling of what's going to happen here. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. Immediately after... The tribulation of those days. Naturally, we are talking about the tribulation of the Antichrist, written in about in Revelation chapter 9, and written all through the book of Revelation, quite frankly. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, does this mean the powers of God in heaven? No. Absolutely not. Does it mean the powers of Christ at the right hand of God who is now returning? No. 
It means the power of them that are in heaven. Where is Satan at? He's behind the throne of God where Christ put him to. Now the fallen angels by this time will be on earth, but they left where? Their first estate as written in the book of Jude. They left their first estate and came down here to deceive men. Verse 30. And then, now where, what time frame are we here at? After the tribulation. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why would you mourn when you see the Son of Man in heaven? Well, people are saying, oh, they're, they're mourning for joy. No, they're mourning because they've been deceived. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That is to say, the last trump, the seventh trump. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, that is to say the four directions, and from one end of heaven to the other. In other words, all the remnant elect in heaven are going to gather too. And where are they going to gather to? They're going to escort Christ to the city of Jerusalem where he shall set up his millennium temple as the people escorted Christ into the city saying, Hosanna, save us now. Verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is tender, is yet tender, and put us forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Okay, so let's examine this. This is a parable. A parabolic story. Parable. The parable of the fig tree, which concerns the good and bad fig. When the branch is yet tender, in other words, when it doesn't look like it's going to grow, when it doesn't look like it's going to spring forth, but it does put forth leaves, not going to put any fruit, but it's going to put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Okay, well, shouldn't a fig tree spring out in the um, spring? Shouldn't it start developing buds and leafing out in the spring? So why is summer then mentioned here? Summer is the harvest. We're talking about the harvest of the end of this earth here. Now I want to point something else out to you that you probably not noticed here. In the translations of the Bible, here in uh, Matthew 24, in verse 32 it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender. His branch. Okay? And if we go uh, if we go to Mark chapter 13 it states when her branch is yet tender and put forth leaves. Now if we check out his and hers here we find that it is G846 in both cases, which is the word autos. Autos. And it can mean himself, herself, him, her, them, and this is not pronouns. This is not uh, virtue signaling pronouns. This is simply what the word can mean in its semantic field. Okay? Why then was it translated in one chapter his and one chapter hers? And if we go to Luke chapter 21, verses 29 and 30, it's written slightly different again. In verse 29 and 30, it's written, And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree. And we find here that this word is G3588, which is ha. I know it looks like it's uh, ho, in the way it's spelled, but it's actually pronounced ha. And it is the same usage of ha that we would use as eth ha adam. It means the. So it means the fig tree. And when we look up this definition, it is the, this, that, one, he, she, it, etc. And then, as we continue with the verse, it says, and all the trees. 
Now, all the trees is also G3588. Ha! Huh? In other words, it's not just the fig tree, but all the trees. The word trees here is dendron, G1186, which means a tree or trees, typically uh, a regular tree, uh, probably an oak, a tree. But it's used here in the plural form, so it is trees. So then, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the generation of the fig tree, the good and bad fig, and we're talking about the other trees. In other words, the Gentiles, the other peoples, the other nations, kindreds, and tongues. Verse 30. When they now shoot forth, in other words, when this action happens, ye see and know your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. In other words, when you see this fig tree of the good and bad fig mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 24, shoot forth, you know that summer is nigh at hand. When did that fig tree shoot forth? When did Israel with the Kenites become a nation again? 1948. So, that was the summer. That was the beginning of summer. Summer is nigh at hand. Now, all through during the summer is the harvest, according to the crops that we grow. But the, har the harvest here is souls. And that's only going to happen th the one time. In other words, at the return of Christ. But it says, when you see these leaves shoot forth, not any fruit... But leaves only, in other words, why would it say uh, shoot forth and not mention any fruit coming from the fig tree? Well, first of all, the branch is yet tender, which means it's a youngling, it's a sapling. Second of all, it shoots forth leaves, but it does not bring any fruit. Even a small tree can bring forth fruit. So what does that mean? It means the people do not accept Christ. The good and the bad fig. Even some of the good fig are deceived by the bad fig. Because the people that dwell in that land now do not accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. In many places they do not even regard Him as a historical figure. But let's get back to why it's translated three different ways here. In other words, it's translated as His branch, Her branch, and the tree when it now shoots forth. If we look back to Genesis chapter 3, Satan was warned of enmity between two seed lines. His seed and the woman's seed, which means two distinct family lines. The line of Cain and the line of Seth, which is why those lines are separated in the Bible and do not interbranch with each other. So his branch, her branch, and the branch, meaning the good fig tree, her seed, the bad branch, or excuse me, the, the good branch of the fig tree, her seed, the bad branch of the fig tree, Satan's seed, in other words the Kenites, and the true Judaites, and the branch itself, which means the people or the generation of the fig tree itself. Which is the generation itself which bears no fruit. In other words, if you go to Jerusalem now, yes, they allow Christians there. But all the Jews there, there are very few Messianic Jews that believe upon Christ. So there's no fruit on that tree. And the ruling body of that tree makes you denounce Christ to even live in Israel. Christians can visit. Uh, Messianic Jews may visit, but they cannot live there. So we've got three branches here which bear no fruit. The good fig bears no fruit. Why? They don't believe in Christ. The bad fig, which bears no fruit. Why? They don't believe in Christ. In other words, why is the good, the good fig is deceived by the bad fig. 
And then we've got the fig itself which shoots forth, which is talking about a particular time slot, a particular time frame, which we're about to re read here. Verse 33. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, what things? The fig tree spring forth, the fig tree generation. Know that it is near even at the doors. What? The end of the world. You have to remember at the beginning of Mark chapter, excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, what the subject is. They ask Christ privately, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of the end of the world and of thy coming? Verse 33. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verse 34. Verily I say unto you that this generation, this particular generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In other words, not even the angelics know of it. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that they entered, that Noah entered into the ark. Noah being the last one as the captain necessarily to enter the ark. But they were feasting. They were enjoying the pleasures and they were marrying and giving in marriage. And who were they giving in marriage to? The fallen angels. And they were burying them children. Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> and these children would become tyrants. Mighty men of renown. Gibor in the Hebrew. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Noah being the Greek for Noah. Verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And so many people try to read rapture into this. Do you not think that the people saw Noah building this ark? It probably took him a very long time to build this ark. Now, do you think the people didn't see it and, and that Noah wasn't prophesying to them? Don't you think Noah, when he went into town to get supplies and went and got stuff and, and got food from the town people or whatever, if he didn't have his own, at least he had a chance to speak to people. Don't you think he was warning them of what was coming? He knew. Verse 40. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, most people say, I want to be the one that's taken. I want to be taken up into the clouds with the Lord Jesus. The only thing they don't realize is the value of this word taken. This word is a word of polarity. It can mean a good thing or a bad thing. However, here it means a bad thing. They're taken as in taken in a snare. It'd be the same thing as if you said to a, 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 a group of returning knights, My lords, the castle has been taken. In other words, they're not taken by God. They're not taken by Christ. Verse 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be left, the other shall be taken. In other words, they're doing the same job. They're working. But one's going to be left and one's going to be taken. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You know, what did Christ tell us? No man knows that hour. Verse 43. But know this. Christ is going to clarify something here. That if the good man of the house had known in what hour, or what watch, that is to say, the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. Verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, again, most people try to use this to say the rapture, the rapture, the rapture. 
the any moment rapture could happen at any time in a time when no man knoweth and uh, be ready for it in other words be faithful unto Christ we know both rapture doctriner and non rapture doctriner are faithful to Christ the only difference is some of them are going to fall and worship the wrong Christ the spurious Christ the false Christ the pseudo Christos in other words why because they do not understand the warnings that were given by Christ of the events that would consummate because we were told we were going to be delivered up for a testimony we were told not to speak because God is going to speak through us with the Holy Spirit so why are they going to think in such an hour as you are in other words why in such an hour as they think not the Son of Man coming because they're gonna believe he's already here on the earth with them they're gonna believe that Satan the Archangel fallen but still beautiful is Christ returned and he's gonna have powers to deceive them as we read in Revelation 12 and 13 he's gonna have a government system under him verse 45 who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? That means to feed his flock, to feed his children. Verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. In other words, that servant's not going to be taken by surprise. He's still going to be feeding the people telling them the truth when he comes verse 47 verily I say unto you she shall make him ruler over all of his goods verse 48 but if that evil servant shall say in his heart my Lord delayeth his coming verse 49 and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and others get into a different ministry and start making money off of it and smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken in other words to, to, to start believing the false doctrines of mystery Babylon and to drink the wine of fornication verse 50 the Lord of that servant shall come in an hour and a day when he looketh for him not and an hour when he is not aware of verse 51 and shall cut him and sunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth in other words Christ said many times lo I have foretold you all things behold I have told you before Christ told us the events that consummate his coming. The book of Revelation of Jesus Christ by John the Revelator of Patmos tells us of the events that are to happen. That Satan shall be cast to the earth. That shortly before Satan the two witnesses shall come. That a world government shall rise and receive a deadly wound. And then come to full power with Satan at its head having seven nations, dominions, mountains and ten horns or ten kings these ten kings being the fallen angels that come to power one hour with the beast the beast system which is to say the system under Satan only Satan is not coming back as Satan he will claim to be Christ he will claim to be the Prince of Peace he will blaspheme the name of the Lord, which is why he is called Antichrist, which means in place of Christ, instead of Christ, in the stead or the place of Christ. And why Christ said, if they tell you Christ is here or lo, he is there, believe them not. If they say he is in the desert or in the secret chambers or places, believe them not. In other words, you have been warned to wait upon your true husband. At any rate, that's where I'm going to end this study. We see now the relevance of the fig tree and why Christ cursed it. Christ cursed it in anger because it bore no fruit. 
but it was a time for the fruit. No. But now, in the generation of the fig tree, is the time of fruit. It is getting near the harvest. Remember what Christ told his disciples? I tell you that the fields are ripe already. Go out and begin gathering. He made his disciples fishermen of men. Fishers of men. So there you have it. This is why Christ cursed that fig tree. That fig tree generation. That fruitless generation. Fruitless. It bears not good fruit. It bears no fruit. It is a self-serving, wicked, and perverse generation. So, there you have it. That's where we're going to end this Bible study. Let me remind you to stay in your Father's Word every day. The day every day in your Father's Word is a great day. If you can't stay in your Father's Word every day, certainly stay in it every week. Study to show yourself approved. Use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the E.W. Bullinger Companion Bible, the Maseratic Text, the Septuagint, whatever you can get your hands on to study our Father's Word. But first and foremost, pray to our Father for guidance and wisdom when you study His Word. And brothers and sisters, always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness because they are the ones that need it the most. So that being said, until we see you next time, may God bless you, and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.